Welcome, Hakit uh, Atiya, for an uh, invited speaker uh, talk today. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, preserving hyper properties uh, when using concurrent objects. Uh, she, I have known Hakit Gardner's, I guess, about 20 years now, give or take. Uh, she is uh, the professor at you know, Computer Science at Technion. Uh, she has published numerous papers uh, on numerous topics in distributed computing. Uh, she has uh, she is the editor in chief for distributed computing, which is the premier journal for the uh, area of distributed computing. She has won the Baxter Award in distributed computing for two thousand eleven. She is the she is an ACM fellow. Uh, I have heard her talk in. Uh, many venues, but I have not heard her talk on uh, serialization of hyperproperties. So uh, I look forward to hearing you. Thank you. So thank you. First of all, I'm I'm really honored to uh, speak in uh, the conference. I'm sorry uh, we're not there in person, uh, but uh, I still hope uh, uh, we'll be uh, able to uh, you know uh, transfer the um, my thoughts about uh, this topic, and again, I'm, I'm looking forward to interacting with people after the talk and during the talk as well. Uh, so I assume my uh, slides are visible, and you see my uh, my cursor and my spotlight. So uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you know, it's usually recommended to explain the title in the first uh, few minutes uh, of the talk, but let me not do it first, okay? We'll get to know every uh, term there uh, eventually, but uh, I'm gonna start uh, with a question, uh, kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, what do you think is the most significant concept in uh, computer science? And I'm sure uh, you could uh, imagine lots of uh, answers. I threw some, uh, some answers here at Turing Machine, Risk Architecture, Machine Learning in recent years, the TCP IP stack, uh, concept, uh, complexity classes, and so on and so forth. You can write, uh, each of you probably has uh, uh, their own uh, preference in this respect. Uh, but I would argue that uh, there's one um, underlying and maybe unifying concept uh, uh, underlying all these uh, uh, things. And, and I think this is one of the main reasons uh, um, uh, computer science has been so successful. And this is the concept of abstraction. And abstraction, you could spend uh, a lot of time discussing what abstraction is, but um, uh, in a nutshell, basically, this is uh, the ability to um, uh, this is the ability to uh, separate uh, the actual details of how do you do something with the external interface that you are using uh, to access this implementation. And and as I said, I believe you know Turing, a Turing machine is definitely an abstraction of what computation is. A complexity class is basically. Uh, I don't care what the algorithm is doing exactly, but it solves a, a problem is in this complexity, in a complexity class, if we can uh, characterize its, uh, um, compl the complexity of algorithms for it in a certain way. And of course, the communication uh, protocols are a prime example of uh, abstraction. And the reason uh, abstraction is so important and I think so key to the success of computer science is because it allows us to uh, separate uh, concerns and basically improve uh, underneath uh, the hood uh, certain things and work on other things separately without worrying what is happening uh, in other uh, places. So risk uh, uh, the whole concept of architecture is, is actually computer archi architecture. It's actually all about abstraction. So we can go on designing our algorithms without worrying about the actual technology used to implement transistors that, uh, that actually run them and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's ab abstraction in general. In the specific uh, case of uh, concurrent computing, a uh, primary way in which abstraction is used is that uh, by having um, a program and the program uh, is using an abstract object. And basically we can write the program uh, 
considering that uh, we are using the abstract object, and then at some point uh, uh, replace it with another uh, with an implementation of this object. And again, an exa a good example is using the register abstraction. So we write a concurrent program. We assume that we have an atomic uh, register, basically to which we can read and write atomically. So this is a concept, an object defined by, by Lamport. And then essentially we can uh, go to a communication system and specific uh, systems in which we don't really have atomic registers and we replace this uh, atomic register with something else. And an example that is uh, very close to my heart, obviously, is the ABD, the Atia Bernoy de Lev implementation of an atomic register, simulation of an atomic register in failure prone uh, message passing systems. Okay. So instead of uh, running the program with the, with the, the abstract uh, atomic register, uh, we actually run the program using the, uh, uh, employing the register uh, simulation and message passing system. So if all the communication of the program was done through uh, atomic registers, then we can just take the program and port it to work in a message passing system that is failure prone. Uh, failure prone means that um, some of the participating nodes uh, in the message passing system may fail by, stop, uh, by stopping to execute or being delayed uh, greatly. And this uh, simulation works as long as uh, uh, at, at most a minority of the processes uh, fail. So at least a majority of the processes continue to work. Okay. So actually this is the, uh, the implementation itself. And, and this is not exactly our original implementation. It's an extension uh, by Lynch and Schwarzman in which we have a multi-writer uh, register. So it's a reg an atomic registers, register to which uh, many processes can write and many processes can, uh, and from which many processes can read. And I think one of the, uh, I believe one of the reasons uh, the ABD implementation uh, uh, became so popular is uh, because it's a rather simple uh, algorithm. It's a very, very simple algorithm. And, and it's really almost, uh, it's, this is almost the, the real algorithm. Okay, so what do we do in this algorithm? So the algorithm, as I said, assumes that the majority of the processes uh, is correct and always responses. So what we do in a write operation is that we broadcast a query and basically what we have in mind is that uh, we take the value of the register and rather than so storing it in a particular place, we replicate it at all the uh, servers, the, the, uh, a large number of servers. And in order to write a new value, what we do is we contact the, uh, all the current servers. And what we ask them is ask them, what is the timestamp of the current value? So each value is, has an associated timestamp. And basically, when we want to write, we check what is the largest, the value with the largest time, uh, st stored uh, uh, timestamp. And we take, uh, and okay, so we query all the other uh, uh, servers. We wait for replies from a majority of them. We pick the largest timestamp of these replies. So we actually ignore the values that we get, but we just consider the timestamps. We take the largest timestamps, timestamp, we add one to it, and then we send out the, uh, a, message, a message saying, here's my new value and this is my timestamp, which is the current maximum plus one. And then we call it the operation. One quick interruption. Yeah. You are assuming synchronous system here? Or no, it's actually an, an asynchronous system. Okay, so the moment you, okay, fine. Thank you. So I wait for an, my, uh, uh, an acknowledgement for a majority of the other servers. Okay. Thank you. And the read is almost the same. Again, I broke the query to all the servers. I wait for replies from a majority. I get the value and timestamp uh, pair with the largest uh, timestamp. Okay. And then basically I'm going to return the value that this value with the largest timestamp. So instead of incrementing the timestamp and, uh, and writing a new value, but before I complete, I don't just return the value. I do what's known as a write back. And I broadcast uh, basically the same update message with the value I'm going to return and the timestamp it had. And I wait for an, uh, an, a majority uh, of acknowledgements, acknowledgements from a majority of uh, notes. And then I return the value. 
okay? So basically I didn't really introduce a new value to the system, but I'm like pushing back the value I'm going to return. I will not go to the details why this uh, part is necessary, but it is uh, necessary, it could be proved uh, to be necessary. So that's, a, I think, a very simple algorithm, uh, not, you know, and, and actually reasonably uh, efficient. I mean, it's not extremely efficient, but it's, it's not like a huge uh, cost, it's linear. And the point is that once you have this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of an implementation, uh, what you could do is basically uh, design algorithms thinking that you have a, a, an atomic register, but then actually deploy them in a message passing system where uh, a minority of uh, processes can fail. Okay, and two nice examples are uh, the disk process uh, algorithm of Daphne and Lamport, which basically they developed first for shared memory, uh, atomic register uh, context, and then ported to a situation where, uh, where uh, there's uh, replicated servers using basically uh, uh, some version of this algorithm. And more recently, uh, Garau et al. Uh, had an uh, algorithm uh, to implement the asset transfer part of uh, the Bitcoin protocol. And again, they initially developed it uh, assuming atomic registers and then ported it to a message passing system uh, uh, using uh, ABD. So, so basically existence of the abstraction of a, an implementation uh, of the uh, atomic register abstraction in shared memory allows you to write programs assuming a shared register and then port them to the uh, message passing system. And this is just one example. And what we argue is that when we do this porting, basically uh, uh, some properties that uh, we have proved for the original program are preserved, okay? So basically this is uh, what we've seen up till now is an, uh, an instance of what is called refinement. Uh, so again, we have a program, we have the abstract object, the specification. In our case, this was the atomic register. And then uh, we have a, a concrete object in implementation that I'll call opt, okay? And um, when we refine the specification with the object, we want to uh, say, uh, we say that uh, we have a refinement, which I denote with this uh, less than or equal uh, 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 symbol. And we say that the, uh, the object is a refinement of the specification, if and only for any prop, uh, program P, the traces that we get, the behaviors that we get when we run the program using the abstract object, the, the, the concrete object are a subset of the traces that we get when we run the program with the specification. So this is called trace inclusion. So all the behaviors we get when we run with a concrete object with the implementation are a subset of the behaviors we can get when we run the program with the abstract uh, object with the specification. Now, if we have properties that are properties of traces, for example, mutual exclusion or even termination, then if we have uh, refinement, then they are preserved. Trace properties are preserved under refinement. Okay. And a spe specific case uh, of uh, refinement, a very, uh, like, a very, uh, like the gold standard uh, of a refinement is uh, when the abstract object is itself sequential, like an atomic register, then what we have here refinement is based, uh, we get linearizability. So a special, an important special case of refinement is linearizability, okay? And, and the good thing about refinement is because of this uh, trace inclusion uh, property, we have the, the, the feature is kind of immediate that uh, uh, if we have uh, trace inclusion, if we have refinement, then any uh, property of traces, so if you have a property of traces that I call here phi, then it is preserved, okay? So if you prove that something holds when, uh, when we run the program with the abstract specification, then uh, it will hold uh, uh, when we run the program with the concrete object, with the implementation, so to speak. Okay, so many good things are, are properties of traces. So as I mentioned, mutual exclusion and some termination properties and so on and so forth. But an important thing to note is that not all the properties we care about, and especially in modern uh, contexts, are trace properties. 
Okay, so let me emphasize, a trace property is a property that you look at an, an individual trace, an individual behavior and interaction, and you know whether it holds or not. So like there are no two processes in the critical section is a property of an individual uh, uh, trace. Uh, the program eventually terminates as a property of an individual trace. But think about the property like um, uh, the expected number of steps is at most order of n. Okay, this is not a property of in, an individual trace. You need to the, the you need to take uh, to have a probability distribution over several uh, traces, and you need to to uh, you know uh, compute uh, expectation. And it's necessarily not a property of an individual trace. Okay. So as, uh, as we'll see soon, uh, trace properties are not enough to capture everything that we want to describe. But before we move on, I want to mention how you prove uh, uh, refinement. And the way you prove refinement is basically uh, by relating the states of the abstract and the concrete object. So remember, the abstract object is the specification and the concrete object is the implementation. And one way to prove uh, uh, refinement is called forward simulation. So basically you show that if you have concrete st a concrete state, uh, one concrete state of the concrete object, the implementation, and you have a transition in the implementation to another concrete state. And we show a simulation relation to the a state of the abstract object. Then it is possible to identify an, an abstract, a state of the abstract uh, uh, object so that it is in the simulation relation with the concrete state, the second concrete state, and the, it has a transition uh, in the abstract uh, object from the first uh, abstract state. Okay, so that's a forward simulation, and that's actually the most common way to prove linearizability or simulations in general. And for example, proofs that are based on explicit linearization points, for example, when you use consensus objects or compare and swap in such uh, strong objects, are typically uh, using forward simulation. So if you go through the code and you say, oh, this is where I'm going to linearize the operation, then uh, you, this is basically uh, will correspond to um, to forward simulation. But interestingly, uh, uh, forward simulations are not enough. And they are not enough even for, uh, for rather simple algorithms like the ABD implementation of the shared register. So I didn't mention how you prove correctness of the ABD simulation, but the, the ABD implementation, but the way you do it is basically using the timestamps that we have identified for each uh, operation. And what we do when we prove the correctness of ABD is uh, um, is um, uh, is to take all the writes and order them by their timestamps. Okay, and after we order all the uh, writes according to their their timestamps, basically we insert reads in the appropriate places in a way that they they are after the writes they return uh, whose values they return. Okay, and this proof is actually, it's a simple proof, but there's no place in the, no explicit place in the, uh, in the execution of a write operation where we linearize the operation. We kind of go and we look all at all the writes that we have in the system, including some writes that didn't uh, complete yet, and we take their timestamps and we linearize them. And such proofs are not forward simulations. In fact, there are uh, what uh, uh, what we call uh, backward simulations. So in backward simulations, we have again this transition from a concrete state, first concrete step uh, of the implementation to another con concrete step of the implementation, and we have the simulation relation to uh, an a state of the abstract object, the specification. And in a backward simulation, we we say that there exists. Uh, uh, prior, prior uh, state of the abstract uh, object, the specification that is in the simulation relation with the prior uh, step, the concrete uh, prior step, and uh, uh, can be transitioned into the abstract, the second abstract uh, state. And uh, what uh, Lynch and Van Drager uh, proved in I think mid 90s, uh, more or less, 
that you can prove linear as a, you can always prove linearizability with a mixture of using forward and backward uh, simulation. And if you know how to prove, uh, if you are familiar with formal techniques for proving properties of programs, uh, basically uh, uh, using uh, auxiliary variables, basically forward simulation uh, corresponds to um, uh, history variables and backward simulation corresponds to what's called prophecy variables. And prophecy variables, if you want, this is the after the fact relation. So you like uh, predict or profess what will be the future and decide how you will, uh, what you will do in, in, in the present. So that's a very interesting uh, theory, uh, not ours. Okay, so that's how you prove refinement. And uh, as I already hinted, uh, okay, uh, um, refinement uh, and, and trace properties are not enough, okay? So uh, let me show you uh, uh, basically an interesting example. Uh, it is distilled from uh, an example, uh, we distilled it uh, from an example uh, given by Hadzilakis, who intuit in a recent policy paper, but we have uh, adapted it specifically to uh, ADD. So what I want to show you now is basically an example of a fairly simple program. Uh, it's a program using shared memory. I call it W, it's here in uh, blue. And what I'll show you is that there's a property of this program that we can prove when, uh, that, that holds when we uh, use uh, atomic registers, but it does not hold when we substitute the atomic registers with the ABD implementation, okay? So although ABD is a refinement of an atomic register, it does not preserve all the properties that we want to, uh, may want to have. Okay, so the, the program is a fairly simple uh, program. It, uh, it's a program for uh, three processes, P0 and P1 and P2. And what we have is that uh, uh, the program uses two registers, R and C. And what we do is basically uh, P1 and P, P0 and P1 try to write to, uh, write to R, basically write their identifier. And basically P2 tries to see the two distinct writes. It's something that may happen and may not happen. Okay, and we don't know in which order P1, P0 and P1 will write to uh, R. But after they write to R, so P0 goes home, uh, and uh, P1 basically flips a coin and writes it in C. Okay, so that's what they do. P0 and P1 write their identifier to R, so they write 0 and 1 respectively to R, and then P1 flips a coin and writes it to C. Now what P2 tries to do, okay, it treats R twice. Okay, and it hopes to catch the two distinct writes. It may happen, it may not, may not happen. Okay, and then it reads the, uh, the coin flip. And now it calculates a fairly complicated, I mean, a somewhat complicated condition. But what you want to uh, know is basically that uh, if, um, uh, if it uh, manages to catch the two uh, distinct uh, values, then it will return uh, true if uh, the value of the coin flip is equal to the last value written, okay? And if it doesn't manage to catch the two distinct coin flips, it always returns false, okay? So I wanna show you that uh, uh, if P2 returns, sorry, if it, if it doesn't catch the two different values, then it returns true, sorry. Okay, so basically I want to show, to argue that it returns uh, true with probability half if we have atomic registers, okay? So as I said, the, the condition here is written in a way that if uh, P2 doesn't manage to catch the two distinct uh, uh, rights, so basically if it reads before both rights or it reads in the middle of the two rights or it reads after both rights, so it sees the same value in, in, the, in both rights, then it necessarily returns true. Okay, it's, it's easy to set up something like that, okay? So the only case we need to worry about is what happens if it uh, reads two distinct values. So this is what we have here. So P0 writes zero, P1 writes one, 
And then the two reads of P2 are kind of interleaved correctly. So it catches the first uh, read, the first right, and then it catches the second right. And let's assume that this is the order uh, in which uh, things happen, the rights happen. The, the program is also set in a way that if uh, the coin was not flipped or nothing happened, so that it's, it's written in a way that it handles correctly all the corner cases. Okay, so, uh, so then P, uh, P2 manages so uh, zero and then one. And note that uh, at this point, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the coin is flipped. So note that when the coin is flipped by P1, uh, 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 P1 already wrote its uh, value. And the, the order between these two rights is already set. Okay, because uh, P1 flips its, flips its coin after it writes. And this happens either after the write of P0 or before the write of P0. Okay, but the order between these two writes is already set, is already determined when P1 uh, flips its coin. Okay, now uh, P2 reads this coin and basically with probability half, it's, it, it either gets the, uh, basically with probability half, uh, the value of the coin is either equal to the value of the last uh, uh, right, or it's it is not equal to the value of the last right. Okay, so that's uh, a very hand wavy and, and, and rough uh, sketch of uh, how we can argue that when we have atom really atomic registers, the program uh, 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 P2 returns true with probability half. And of course, we, we can turn, turn this returning half into uh, uh, into uh, Proof that uh, you know into something that you know you terminate you terminate with probability half or you do good things with probability at least half. Okay, so although I'm talking about the returning true or false, we can turn it into uh, important useful properties. Okay, now let's see what happens if instead of using the truly atomic registers, we replace, we actually need to replace just R with, uh, with the ABD implementation, but you could think that we are replacing also uh, C. Okay, so this is again the ABD implementation, the multi-writer uh, multi version uh, that I had in previous slides. And now what we can show is that uh, an, an adversary can play the messages of this algorithm in a way that P2 always return false. And the intuitive reason is that the rights are, at least one right is still pending when the coin could be pending when the coin is flipped. And then the uh, adversary can schedule its messages and the messages P2 gets in a way that it gets the, the wrong value uh, after uh, C is flipped. So here's the, the way you do it. So I'm, I'm not gonna go into the actual specifics, but let me just give you a, an idea. <clears throat> so basically we have uh, P0 starts its right, and then P1 does it right and completes it. Okay, and then P2 starts its right. And then since P1 completes its right, it flips the coin. Okay. And now you see what happens is one right by P1 was completed, but one right by P0 is still pending. And so are the two uh, reads by uh, P1, P2, sorry. And now the adversary can see what happens, uh, what the, what's the result of the coin flip. And now, since there are these two operations, uh, actually one right and two reads in progress, it can schedule the, uh, the uh, uh, pending right and the pending reads in a way that uh, P2 will first see the zero and then see the one. Okay. And alternatively, if the coin flip is uh, one, then the adversary can schedule the uh, pending right and the pending reads in a way that uh, P2, P1, uh, P2 first uh, returns uh, one and then returns zero and then it returns false. Okay, so again, the details are, you know, take some uh, effort to schedule the messages correctly and to get everything right and not confuse yourself with uh, the ones and the zero and what's first and what's second, but you could work out the, the details. So what we had is we had a property, termination with probability, I mean, returning true with probability half, okay. Uh, 
which held when we had atomic registers, but does not hold when we have uh, we replaced the registers with an ABD implementation. Okay, so that's not great. And that's actually a specific uh, 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 instance of uh, other properties, a more general class of properties that are called hyper properties. So I think that's the, my, uh, my uh, depth uh, from the title. So what are hyper properties? Basically, hyper properties, uh, roughly stated, are properties that you need to consider uh, sets of traces in order to evaluate their correctness. So I already mentioned things like uh, expected uh, behavior and so on and so forth. So uh, two primary uh, classes are quantitative properties. So for example, termination with high probability. So I say that I, I give a probability distribution to traces and I say that uh, with high probability, I terminate in like large, uh, uh, a large uh, subset of the um, uh, pro uh, of the traces, uh, mean response time, and various probability distributions, expected behaviors, and so on. So these are quantitative properties, especially for uh, distributed uh, for randomized uh, algorithms. And uh, you need to consider sets of traces in order to uh, make sure they hold. Another class of properties is security properties. And, and a good example is what's called uh, non-interference. So basically, uh, when I have uh, low clearance and high clearance variables and uh, uh, assertions about the behavior of a program, and if I have access to uh, low clearance, only to low clearance variables, I cannot tell, uh, uh, say anything about the value of high clearance uh, variables. I will not talk more about security properties, but they actually fit within the same framework. So as I already stated, hyper properties are properties that we evaluate on sets of traces. And specifically hyper safety properties are properties of sets of finite traces. So I guess you can guess, you can probably guess where I'm going uh, to. So basically, uh, I, I ask, does refinement preserve hyper properties? And the answer is negative. So refinement does not preserve hyper properties. So just ensuring trace inclusion, and if, as, as is done by refinement, is not enough for, uh, for preserving hyper properties because we may be mapping one, uh, one trace of, uh, of the program with the uh, uh, implementation to many. Uh, so the, the, the mapping is, is just an inclusion. It's not a more precise uh, uh, correspondence. And this is, this was very, this is a known uh, result from the formal methods uh, uh, literature. So it's not surprising uh, that uh, uh, it was rediscovered uh, 16 years uh, later uh, by Golub, Haim, and Wofel. And uh, they have shown that linearizability does not preserve probability distributions uh, under uh, uh, certain adversaries in the distributed setting. Okay, so that's um, bad news. And again, I, I have shown you this in a concrete case of uh, ABD. <clears throat> and in their paper, uh, Gola Batal uh, also presented the notion they called strong linearizability. And strong linearizability is uh, an extension or a restriction, a strengthening of linearizability, and where they uh, require that linearization points do not depend on the uh, on the future, are uh, are determined in a in a uh, I don't know past uh, prefix uh, closed uh, manner, and they've shown that if uh, an object is strongly linearizable, then when you substitute it, when you use it instead of a sequential object, then uh, uh, you preserve probability distributions even under strong adversaries. So in uh, early work with Constantine and now, I, uh, we have uh, introduced a generalization of uh, strong linearizability, which is almost natural given where we've been uh, now, and we call it strong refinement. And that's the definition of strong refinement. Basically, uh, it's similar to refinement, but it's subs uh, subscripted with S to say that it's strong. So a uh, concrete object is a strong refinement of a specification if for all programs, as we had before. But now we introduce uh, um, explicitly the scheduler, the one uh, 
the, the basically the adversarial could be adversarial scheduler that determines the, the interleaving of processes. And whenever, uh, so for every deterministic scheduler of uh, the program using the concrete uh, object, uh, we can find a deterministic scheduler of the program with the abstract object such that the traces that we get are equal. Okay, not included, but they are not a subset, but they are equal to the traces uh, of the program with the scheduler and the abstract object. And uh, here's the definition for its uh, deterministic scheduler or strong adversary, uh, basically chooses the next step um, uh, to, execute, uh, to execute based on, on the past, on the prefix. And uh, the theorem that is not, is, is actually rather uh, simple to prove once we have, uh, we have the, the right definitions is that, um, uh, uh, that uh, that um, <clears throat> uh, that uh, and if an object, uh, a concrete object, is a strong refinement of a, an abstract object uh, spec, then for every program, when you run, uh, if you run the program with the specification with the, the, the abstract object, and and it preserves some hyperproperty H. Then, when you run the program with the concrete object, it also preserves the same hyper, hyper safety uh, property. Okay. So, if we uh, so basically, uh, this part of this work shows that uh, strong refinement is basically an, a generalization of, um, of strong linearizability. And if you preserve, if you can show strong refinement, then you are preserving uh, hyper safety properties. <laughs> The nice thing about doing all that, so, so far this was more mostly uh, a counter example and, and various definitions. But the nice thing about that uh, is that uh, it's easy to show, uh, I, I, I have a, a sense that I've hidden, um, sorry, let, let me, I have a sense that I've hidden, uh, a slide that I didn't mean to hide. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so strong refinement uh, allows you to preserve hyper properties. And a nice thing about strong refinement is uh, about phrasing this result in this way is that we can uh, show that uh, <coughs> strong refinement is equivalent to forward simulation. Okay, so if we sh we've shown that an object refines an object, and, and our proof is based on a forward simulation, we know that it that it uh, it must be uh, a strong refinement. Okay, and actually the converse is also true. That if uh, uh, if some refinement is strong, that you then you must have a forward simulation to prove this. Okay, and knowing that this is uh, that something is a for so this says this tells you I think already quite a few things. So one thing is it tells you th that um, if you have a simple proof based on on, on uh, linearization points, then probably your implementation is strongly linearizable. Okay. So it's like a kind of a rule of thumb, and and it's almost tells you it also tells you almost the converse that if you have a, a an implementation, and the implementation and the proof for, for its correctness is sort of after the fact, then there's a good chance that your implementation is not strongly linearizable. Okay, and we've seen this with the ABD. So ABD is not strongly linearizable. We've seen this through the counter example. This also gives you uh, 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 an easy way to prove compositionality of strong refinement. And it's actually uh, two types of compositionality. And, and uh, Golop et al. proved uh, one of these, but they actually had a fairly complicated proof for that. And, and once you have uh, the equivalence to forward simulation, it's actually uh, rather simple to prove that. So we can have uh, what I call a horizontal composition, and it's called locality for linearizability. So basically, I can have one object implement another abstract object strongly, and then another object implement strongly implement strongly refine another object, 
And then when we put them uh, together, they strongly refine the two objects, the two abstract objects together. So that's called uh, horizontal uh, locality or a horizontal composition. And you can also get a hierarchical composition. <clears throat> Basically, if I uh, have uh, 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 if I have an implementation of one object from sorry of one abstract object from a, from another object, and then I use this uh, abstract object in another implementation to get a, a second object, then I can substitute this one here. Okay, basically use the implementation with the uh, use the implementation instead of the abstract object in the outer implementation, and get uh, a strong refinement of the specification. So basically, this is when we have a layered. Uh, implementation, if you wish. So this uh, follow immediately from uh, uh, from uh, the equivalence to forward simulation. <clears throat> okay, so I defined these things. I showed you when it uh, follows. I've shown you that ABD is not strongly linearizable. So which objects uh, have strong linear linearizable implementations? And some are. <coughs> I mentioned them. Those who have explicit linearization points, some uh, universal interpretations, they are strongly linearizable. But in fact, uh, uh, many uh, objects, many implementations are not strongly linearizable. So uh, besides ABD, uh, well-known algorithms for atomic snapshots and uh, implementations of stacks are not strongly linearizable. And in fact, uh, Helmi, Haim, and Wolfo have shown that uh, snapshots specifically in multi-writer registers uh, etc. have no weight free strong linearizable uh, shared memory implementations. So that's bad news. And um, my first, uh, my next thing is actually to show you even more bad news. So ABD, basically I've shown you is not strongly uh, linearizable because I've shown you an example where uh, hyper property is not preserved when using ABD. So perhaps there is another way uh, to implement uh, a, a strongly linearizable uh, register in a failure-prone message passing system. And as you can imagine, the answer is negative. <coughs> so this is a paper uh, Constantine and uh, uh, Jennifer Welch and myself had that disk uh, just uh, now in disk. So basically, we want to show that there is no strongly linearizable uh, ABD. So we do it by way of contradiction, and we do it by reduction. And I think the reduction is uh, kind of cute by itself. I will not get into its details, but let me just state what the reduction does. So assume we had a strongly linearizable message passing implementation of multi-writer and multi-reader register uh, for end processes. And for any even very small number of failures, possible failures. Okay. And what we'll show is that you, so this is the message passing system. So I have these messages here. It's a system uh, with n processes and a small number of possible failures. And what we'll get from it, we'll get a strongly linearizable shared memory implementation, shared memory implementation of a multi-writer, multi-reader register. But this implementation uh, will be basically weight free and it will use only single writer moody reader uh, registers. So it will be uh, weight free. It will have F plus one, it's the same F here, F, F plus one processes and F possible failures. So see here, we have a small number of failures relative to the total number of processes. And here we have basically just plus one. Okay, just one process may stay alive. And actually we need a result only for two processes. And the reason is that, so this is the system, this is the message passing system, this shared memory system, it has F plus one uh, processes. And the reason we only need it for uh, uh, F equal two is because now we can reduce uh, to the impossibility of a multi-writer register uh, from single writer register proved by Helmut et al. And their proof uh, uses only three processes. So we only need F equal two. Uh, three processes, two failures. I will not go into the details of how this simulation works. It's an extension uh, of the borowski gaffney uh, simulation to uh, uh, the borowski gaffney simulation. The borowski gaffney simulation works inside shared memory, while this implementation takes a message, message this simulation, our simulation, takes a message, a message passing implementation and simulates it in shared memory. And it also preserves, uh, uh, it also preserves uh, 
strong refinement, uh, so to speak. So the details are nice. And uh, I think the uh, video for, uh, I think Constantin, Constantin gave the talk in this, uh, explaining the simulation is available on, uh, on the net, on the internet, on YouTube. Okay. So, so far I mostly brought you bad news. Okay. There are no strongly linearizable snapshots. There are no strongly linearizable ABD. There are no strongly linearizable multi-writer registers and multi-reader registers. You know, everything is bad, 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 bad. Okay. And I also told you that if we will not have strongly linearizable implementations, we basically cannot use abstraction as a leverage in, uh, when designing algorithms. You know, we should be very, very careful. Uh, let me also mention that there's a direct proof of this uh, uh, impossibility result uh, in a recent paper by Chan and Zwakas, who went to it. Okay, so what can we do about this bad, uh, this bad news? So we could just lose hope, basically avoid using abstraction or uh, have uh, various special cases or there are implementation, there are strongly linearizable implementations that uh, work for bounded settings or that are lock-free but not weight-free. So there are all, all sorts of special cases. And, and there are, are viable and probably should be are being pursued. But uh, we, were, we wanted to have a more uh, customized and generic uh, way to handle this uh, venues. And after thinking about this for several years, we uh, got some inspiration from uh, 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 the field called the uh, indistinguishable obfuscation of programs, and more specifically from something called oblivious uh, runs. So I, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but let me explain uh, in a couple of words what uh, oblivious runs do and kind of how they do it. So oblivious runs is basically, uh, I want to, uh, I write programs, and I want to access the memory. So think that my memory is actually not uh, local to my computer, but is somewhere stored on, on, on the cloud. And I wanna go get to these memory uh, locations on the, uh, on the cloud, but I don't want whoever serves, uh, serves my, uh, uh, my uh, request to know what I'm doing and which, uh, which uh, locations I'm looking at, okay? So I don't want Amazon uh, web services to know what I'm uh, accessing because this reveals something about what I'm doing. Okay. So basically there are methodologies. There's actually a very uh, developed uh, line of research uh, in which I can take a program and I can uh, massage it and morph what it's doing in a way that I go to the cloud memory and the adversary cannot know what I'm actually doing. And the basic idea, the mo most uh, expenses, expensive way to do it is as follows. So here's the very simple way. Uh, I, I, let's say I have my, a very big memory and I want to access two locations X and Y. So one thing I could do, this is like the, the simplest thing, but the most uh, wasteful way is I just read all my memory. I get all my memory, I copy it locally, and then I read X and Y. So that's of course, is a, makes nobody knows what I'm accessing, only knows that I'm accessing the memory, but it doesn't know what I'm, uh, nobody knows what I'm accessing specifically, but that's very wasteful. So what you could do is I want to access X and Y, and what I'll do instead is I'll, act, I'll access X, Y, Z, and W. Okay, so instead of accessing the two locations that I really want, I'll access four locations, okay? So I flip a coin, I access uh, two additional random locations, I send this, these requests, I get these four locations and I take the two that I want, okay? So basically by doing more work, the adversary doesn't know what I'm really caring about, okay? And I, uh, the extra work is random, is, is unrelated to what, I'm really, uh, what I really want to do. So this is kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, kind of uh, uh, remote inspiration, but uh, I, I think you'll see why this was an inspiration. So basically uh, what we ended up doing is, uh, what we do is, uh, I call it perturb the computation of the concrete object. So think 
perturb the computation of ABD in the way that is that blunts the adversary and uh, restrict or reduce its ability to uh, uh, fool and, and uh, bias my values, and still keep the functionality of the concrete object indistinguishable from uh, the abstract object. And like in uh, oblivious realms, we use randomization. So we embrace randomization because we know we're going to be in a, uh, in a setup in an environment where randomization is used. So this is what we call blunting. Okay, so here's uh, like a pictorial uh, description, and then I'll show you how it's done in a very simple instance uh, for ABD. So recall this picture that we have the program using uh, the atomic register, and we want to substitute ABD. Now, instead of substituting ABD, okay, so that's like in oblivious run, we don't just do one invocation of ABD. We actually do several invocations of ABD, okay? And then we do several invocations. It has to be done carefully, but we do several invocations of ABD. Okay. And then informally, we flip a coin, pick one of these invocations as our, our return value, and that's uh, what we do. And if the, number of, uh, in, uh, uh, if the number of repetitions that we have is larger than the number uh, uh, of coin flips that the uh, uh, client program P uh, is uh, is having, then the probability that some property holds when we run uh, the program with the atomic. Uh, so so if we have a, a so let's assume we have a property uh, a fee, uh, a hyper property fee. For example, that we have high probability for terminating when we run the program with the atomic register, and if this probability is larger than zero when we run with the atomic register, then it stays larger than zero when we run the uh, M plus one repetition uh, of ABD. Okay, let me do this by an example. So let's go back to the program W, the bad program that we had before. So this is uh, assuming that other program that we have, W, had a single coin flip, just P2 was flipping a coin once. Okay, so because M is one, we need to repeat ABD, kind, kind of repeat ABD twice, M uh, plus one is two. So this is ABD and I made here a space because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna repeat this part of ABD when we get the largest time step, both for the right and for the read. So we take this uh, uh, query, ask for the largest time stamp, take the largest time stamp, and I do it again. And I get another largest time stamp. And then I flip a coin and return one of these timestamps. Note that both timestamps are okay. I could, could have happened as something that I ran. Okay, so picking any of them doesn't change the functionality and the correctness of the algorithm, the, the linearizability, the plain linearizability. And then I work with this uh, timestamp as if uh, this is what I wanted. And same for the read. I query, get the largest timestamp. I query again, get the largest timestamp time step and pick one of them with each of them with probability half. Now, if we uh, took this ABD squared, what we call, okay, we took this ABD squared and ran it with the concrete program from before, then we can prove, if you remember there, we proved that the probability that P returns true is at least half. Now, with this ABD, and when we substituted ABD, the probability was zero, basically. The adversary could make, the, make sure that the, uh, uh, the P2 never returns uh, true. With ABD2, uh, ABD squared, uh, the adversary can still ruin the probability. So uh, it's uh, uh, three, three eighths, which is worse than half. But it's still a number and not so bad number. Okay, so we deteriorated a bit. The adversary did uh, gain some power because we were using ABD, but not very much, okay? And we can bound the probability. The general theorem I had in the previous slide uh, was uh, qualitative, uh, but we can prove a stronger, uh, also a general uh, uh, quantitative uh, theorem in, uh, I'll show you in the next slide, okay? So basically by doing a bit more work, okay? We managed to preserve uh, the hyper property uh, with a slight deterioration, 
Okay, so this is why we call it blunt. We blunt, we, we, we uh, don't let the adversary be so strong. So that's a, a, a quantitative specific result. Uh, uh, so this is like uh, the general result that we currently have. Uh, basically, uh, we define uh, implementations that are still strong, uh, strongly linearizable. And basically, if again, we look uh, here in the specific case of ABD, we can identify uh, what we call a preamble. So there's a preamble of the uh, uh, operation. And basically, it can be shown that once you've passed the preamble, uh, the linearization is fixed. So, so to speak, after the preamble, um, the operation becomes strongly linearizable. So after, after I've picked my timestamp, the operation, the lineariz my linearization is essentially fixed and cannot be changed. And um, uh, two extreme cases is when the preamble is empty. So the remainder is the whole operation. This is strong linearizability. And when the preamble is the entire operation, this is linearizability because by, by the time the operation is done, my uh, linearization is, is, is fixed, is, is, it will not change. And what you can see in ABD that the preamble is in a sense, uh, it's not a, a shared memory algorithm, but in a sense, the preamble is, uh, is read only because it does not modify, it just queries the other uh, processes. So if we have a strongly linearizable object, a tail strongly linearized object, whose uh, preamble is read only. Uh, so first, uh, ABD is uh, ta tail strongly linearizable with read only preamble. Uh, snapshots, atomic snapshots are also uh, uh, in this class. And uh, as are uh, several uh, register implementations. And we have this general theorem that I will not really go through. It's a, basically a quantitative analog of my previous theorem, uh, basically showing that uh, if a program has some number of coin flips and I uh, repeat the, uh, the preamble k times, where k is larger than, than m, then I can, uh, uh, then I can look at the, uh, then I can basically bound from above the probability of getting some bad behavior with this repeated object uh, as a function of the uh, probability of getting this bad behavior with an atomic object and the initial probability of using, getting this uh, bad behavior with a concrete object. So that's a mouthful and I could spend uh, basically another half hour, another 10 minutes just explaining the theorem and another, uh, 20 minutes or 10 minutes just proving it. But basically it's the same ideas. And, and the intuition of this repetition is that uh, if I'm repeating, uh, if I'm repeating the preamble several times, think about the ABD query uh, uh, in, in the case of the, the counter example program, uh, if I repeat it twice, then at least one of these does not overlap the coin flip. Okay, so it's atomic rel relative to the coin flip. And if it's done before or, before or after the coin flip, then you cannot modify it based, the adversary cannot modify the response value based on the coin flip. So the adversary lost power. And if I happen to pick this one, then the adversary didn't gain anything. So this is my last real slide. Uh, and this is my uh, concluding slide, and which is basically about other directions that could be explored. And I go back to my picture. And basically we can improve and investigate each aspect of this big picture. So for example, instead of uh, 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 linearizability or strong linearizability, refinement or strong refinement, we can consider other relations, refinement relations between the specification and the implementation. Uh, Hadzilakos who went to uh, investigate the right strong linearizability in that context. Uh, I talked, uh, our work considered only safety hyper properties, hyper safety properties. Uh, there's a notion of hyper liveness properties dealing with uh, infinite traces, and you could investigate uh, these properties. I already mentioned quantitative blunting, but definitely it could be improved. And in particular, it could be improved as done for ORAMs, for oblivious RAMs, for specific programs. So if we know something about the structure of the program, maybe we can work more specifically and get uh, better 
uh, uh, better blunting method methodologies, either with uh, less uh, overhead or with better uh, probability, less deterioration. And <clears throat> finally, while uh, what we did uh, uh, was mostly for concurrent objects, one could think of other uh, specifications, for example, transactional memory or even cryptographic protocols uh, uh, in message processing systems. So this uh, concludes my talk right on time. I didn't plan that so well, but still, and uh, I'm happy to take questions. So, uh, any questions from the audience first? Yeah, so let me start with one simple question. So um, uh, the strong linearizability and um, the, the discussion about ABD you mentioned was all in the context of probabilistic methods, right? Uh, you yes. Yeah. So, will it become simpler if you consider deterministic properties and deterministic algorithms? Will this so analysis the, change? Uh, so, you are asking if there is a theorem that says that if you're, you're just uh, plugging if your program, basically, if my program is just uh, uh, is deterministic, then linearizability preserves uh, deterministic hyper properties, whatever these are. Yes, that's one way of extending. And but you know, even for, it's a good question, but uh, uh, not truly because for example, if you have a deterministic program, but you look at uh, probability distribution over the, uh, uh, the interleavings, the possible schedules, then you can consider hyper properties as well. And I don't, I'm not sure this, this is preserved. Okay. Okay. So you already, it's clear that it is not going to be preserved. I, I'm not saying that it's clear that it's not going to be preserved, but if I need to bet, place my uh, money on it, I would assume it doesn't. It's not. Your preserved. intuition says so. Your intuition. My intuition, intuition says it's not. Why? Yeah, so? I mean, that's all. Can you explain because, intuition? Because you 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 don't you 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 see the the trace inclusion might might map many traces into the same uh, trace with the abstract mm -hmm. object, so it doesn't preserve the. The, like it's not a one-to-one -one mapping, so to speak. Okay, so so their distribution, their the probability distribution over them might be different. Okay, okay. But getting a, a concrete example and getting a, a natural, so to speak, concrete example, is is probably not trivial. Okay. So anyway, so it doesn't matter whether it's a probabilistic or deterministic. The results are similar. Going to be similar. That is the but you need some probability in some sense. You need some distribution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so if I think, yeah. Okay. Fine, fine. And other question is this can naturally extend to other uh, correctness criterion like uh, the you said transaction. So naturally, it may extend to serializability. So, uh, so we have you could. And it, mm -hmm. it's even probably a very uh, good way to to capture things that people were looking. So there's work by um, uh, and Chef et al. It's actually work that appeared in the database. Uh, and basically, you could, for example, this actually has to do with security properties because you have a program that uh, you run two transactions and uh, because the transaction is not atomic it aborts in certain situations and this reveals information because this tells you that there was a conflict and uh, you could capture this through, uh, through a hyper property and basically you, you can have kind of a strong opacity notion or strong serializability notion uh, not strong, something called strong serializability, but, but like the strong refinement version of serializability to show that uh, that aborted transactions do not leak information. Right. Okay, and uh, we've started working on that, but it never matured enough to be published. So there's there is an interesting um, uh, thread there. Okay, so yeah, yeah, extending would be very interesting. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In the excuse, shall I ask yeah, one query? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah, this, yeah, 
it's a nice uh, presentation uh, dr hagita tian so i have this uh, small confusion so we know that uh, the read only transactions are not uh, serializable uh, your one you told that you know the read only preamble they are serializable how do, how do i probably i missed what is preamble means so in the transactions paradigm we say read only transactions are not uh, are are not realizable maybe it's actually not the confusion you see uh the read only pre the, the preamble is really in in a way a preparation step mm -hmm. when you collect information and while you are in the preamble at least in this implementation and actually suspect it carries over to some of the work on uh, read only transactions truly read only transactions Uh, before you go to commit. The preamble is, is basically when you do preparation and your serialization point, if I take the analog, if I move to the uh, transactions uh, 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 vocabulary, then uh, uh, your serialization, serialization is not at all sure. You may be about it. And even where exactly you'll be serialized is not always uh, uh, absolutely sure. Okay? So I actually think it, uh, I think, again, although it's coming from a, a somewhat different domain, I actually think uh, um, it, it, it does align. I, I don't feel, I mean, it might be confusing, but I actually feel that, uh, so you may think of this broadcast part as, as analogous. It's not really a commit part, but this is where the, the operation really happens. Okay, well, the preamble is just a preparation to know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm, what we do in this blunting thing, we kind of, I prepare something, one thing, and I prepare another thing, and then I decide with which of them to continue. Okay. Okay, okay. and I would think about uh, ordinary transactions. I think you could do this there as well. I mean, it's a waste of work, of course, okay? There is a, I mean, it's not like nothing, but in terms of what you get at the end, why not? take a snapshot of everything twice. It doesn't hurt, I mean, just to waste work. So you, you told that, you know, the traces similarity, does it uh, include the order of, uh, because it is concurrent and if it is probabilistic, the, the order also, it, uh, it matters. So does this similarity definition includes the order of uh, occurrence? So that's, that's, I, I'm going back to this picture, I think. What you want to see is that uh, because some operations are pending in this, this when you do this uh, preamble just once, mm -hmm. once the coin is flipped, the adversary can continue the execution in various ways. Okay, and in a way that can be beneficial or beneficial to the adversary or bad for your program. Okay, but if I have, if I execute the preamble twice, then the adversary can kill one of them, you know, can manipulate one of them badly, mm. but you cannot manipulate two of them because only one of them is pending when the conflict, at most one of them is pending when the conflict happens. And the other is sort of atomic relative to the uh, conflict. Okay. okay. And if then I'm lucky to pick that one, I won against the adversary. And if I wasn't, then the adversary won against me, but okay, I lost something. I was losing something already before and I, I lose a bit more. No, no, I'm talking about when you talk about the composition and in the composition, uh, the traces of a composed object. So, There, if you have the similarity of this composed objects, so probably occurrence does matter. Yeah, but again, the, the thing is that I get a trace that is a legitimate uh, uh, trace, but it's not the good trace. You see, it's not the trace where the coin flip was beneficial to me. So the adversary can always move me to the trace where the coin flip was not beneficial. You see, all traces are, are good, but not all traces give me the really good result that I want in, in, this, in, in this program, 
Even when in the atomic situation, not all traces are good. Not some traces are eaten uh, false, but I can prove that they, they don't have, they have a bounded probability. Okay. Okay. So if not all traces are good for me, sometimes I can like, uh, uh, what's the word for that? Uh, blow up their probability in some sense, if I use the substitute, the implementation, the concrete object. Mm. Okay, thank you. That's, that's yeah. Sandeep, you can. So, I guess one question I had was, you know, you used this technique for blunting, uh, and is there a place where it doesn't work? Is I mean, the blunting. Uh, oh, so for example, you know, if if the preamble is not read only. Oh right. Then I cannot just repeat it. Okay, it, it's not something repeatable. So for example, uh, the stack uh, implementation of, uh, there's a, a, a stack implementation in uh, common two, I, I don't know. I mean, so this is very, my answer now is going to be very, very technical. Uh, so there's a stack implementation of uh, uh, Afek, Morrison and Gaffney, I think, uh, that is what's called in common two. It's an implementation from test and set, read, read writes and test and set. And it's linearizable, but not strongly linearizable. And it has a very nice proof, actually. It's like a very cute algorithm, very non-obvious. And as I said, whenever you see a non-obvious algorithm, it's probably not strongly linearizable. Anyway, but, uh, but there they have a preamble, but I don't think it's read-only, or it's not simply read-only. So another extension would be, for example, if you could do the preamble several times and then flip a coin and roll back some of the, uh, the, the ones that you don't need to, you're not going to use, but that's more complicated and I'm, I'm not sure it works. Okay, so that's a, a direction, okay? But that, that definitely, and the, the real issue with blunting is actually the, the cost, oh, the, the blow up in, uh, in, uh, that you have. It's, uh, if you take the whole program and the program, throughout its execution flips lots of coins, could be infinite in some situations, then this doesn't work because you need to have a bound on the number of coin flips, for example. So there are various things like that and there are, we have thoughts of how to handle that, uh, to address them, but I really think that this is just a very, very first step. Uh, maybe you could do better analysis, for example, and get, uh, because our analysis, the, the, the theorem that we have here is, is really bad. I mean, the numbers are, I mean, first of all, horrible. I mean, just hard to look at. But it's also, you know, you need to have a very big K in order to get uh, reasonable results here. So there could be a better analysis. Maybe there's a better transformation. So I, I really think of what we, we have done as just uh, really just a very first step that indicates that uh, uh, there might be um, there might be uh, more to do, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that you know other people uh, who are maybe smarter with probabilities than uh, than us uh, could get better results or just different results. What philosophically, what makes the L strongly the, the linear eligible? Uh, basically, that you have you start with something that is not strongly linearizable, mm -hmm. and then you become strongly linearizable. So essentially, the way it's defined is that when you finish, you are, you are strongly linearizable, but it's in some sense too late, so to speak. But if this part until the strong linearizable, the the you become strongly linearizable is read only, then you could mess with it easily, so to speak. Okay, you can play with it. You can perturb it more easily because it's, it's read only, so you can repeat it or, or do things with it in some sense. But again, I'm not saying that this is the only possible theorem. I, I could imagine other classes having other theorems. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'll be happy to see that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Sandeep, you can. Uh, 
How am I doing good time? I don't know what was. I, I'm already late, so I don't want to. Yeah, it looks like. Fifteen minutes into the break, I think. Okay. Uh, so, so I think in five minutes the next session is going to start. So. Five. Okay. So you should go and get your tea. I, I'm always amused to see that uh, you have tea break and not coffee break. <laughs> uh, but I did get tea. Uh, just. Uh, and not coffee. <laughs> so maybe I'll ask one question while, I don't know, you guys can get tea. I just wanted to ask this question to Hagid. So, sure. are, there, so, are there some security properties for which strong linear usability is possible and where it's not possible? I mean, once where you are in the hyper property domain already. I don't know. Um, most of the work done so far was in the context of um, a quantitative behavior like expect determination, et cetera, et cetera. Not so much security. Um, I, I, this is something I hope to do, but didn't get around. Uh, is actually no, I was to, surprised that even linear usability was possible in some hyper properties. I didn't think I, you know, my intuition would have told me that that's not possible. So I'm glad that it's possible. Well, you need a stronger uh, version, right. which is rarely obtained. And there's also the situation where this is not, uh, so for example, think that what you have here is like a Baha's reliable broadcast, which is used in many, uh, in many uh, cryptographic protocols, like in one way, one form or, or another. Uh, and uh, basically what people do, Baha's broadcast is, has a very similar communication pattern you send to everyone you wait to get so many uh, some number of responses and nice f responses and so on and so forth and most of the analysis is then assuming the abstraction of the bracha protocol the specification uh, and then the actual implementation is substituted and i must be uh, uh, to be honest i'm not sure that all of this is correct I mean, I, I didn't find an, an inquiry, a, a counterexample yet, but I'm, uh, if I were using it, I, I would be worried, so to speak. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a disaster waiting to happen, if you ask me. So you see some papers, they substitute the, the implementation and then they do the analysis, not against the abstract uh, protocol, but against actual implementation. So in a way they are not using the abstraction. Right. So they, they analyze this combined uh, thing rather than uh, assuming the abstract uh, protocol. Uh, so that's a way to, to avoid the, the disaster, so to speak but it's not uh, appealing. Well, once again, thank you very much, Hakit. That was a really interesting talk. Thank and you.